The Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. Well, we have a first-time novelist on the show this week, Saskia Sargenson, with her book, The Twins. She told me to shut up when we had to sit in that little room with a man and a woman, asking us the same questions over and over. What did we do? What did we see? What time and when and where? They thought we were wicked, you see. They thought we'd done something unforgivable. Get the latest audio download from the Richard and Judy Book Club. Check out whsmith.co.uk slash Richard and Judy. Well, we always love featuring debut novelists um, on uh, the Richard and Judy Book Club with WH Smith. Um, and this list is no exception, but she's the only exception, actually. She is the only debut novelist on our list. Saskia Sargentson, and her first book is called The Twins. Um, it's a lovely, lovely, lovely novel. Um, very, very uh, imaginative, very emotional, very, very compelling. Uh, and Saskia's with us now. Hi. Hi. Um, I know you're not a twin yourself, but what gave you the idea of writing about identical twins? Not just twins, but identical twins. Um, because I, I have identical twins, daughters. Oh, do you? Yes. I didn't know that. Congratulations. Yes. How old are they? They're 22. Oh, right. So, um, You're joking. You look about 18. <laughs> That's true. I don't think so. Yeah, okay. But uh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're 22 now, so I've actually grown up, well, they've grown up, and I've watched them kind of develop and been fascinated by their relationship and had thought in the past I'd like to write about them. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually I had this idea for a story and it just seemed perfect to put twins into it. And um, I felt I knew enough about identical twins to, to tackle well, the Well, this issue. is fascinating, now, now we know this. I mean, the, the, the twins in the book, um, Izzy and, and Viola, uh, they're, as you say, identical, completely genetically the same, but they're very different. They grow up mm. completely different, don't they? Is mm. that the case with your, with your daughters? Yeah, absolutely. Really? They, have, they have the same talents, but they're such different people, and they are identical. And um, I mean, they were born five minutes apart, and they, they look exactly the same. Well, they they don't when you get when you get to know them, they don't look the same. But at first glance, their colouring and the shape of their faces and everything is exactly well, it's the same. Well, same with ours because we've got twins by Judith's That's first right. marriage, Tom yes. and Dan, who are yes. thirty six now, and mm -hmm. a, a lot of people do confuse them, don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah. again, they're they're pretty different. Totally different. So that actually raises a question. Let, let's talk about Isolta and Viola. These lovely names. I think mm -hmm. I think they're gorgeous. Born to a hippie mother, a single mother. Um, and uh, absolutely, completely alike. And uh, there's one line close to at the beginning of the book saying, we used to be the same person. Um, because they did. Mm. All, all identical twins are obviously start off as, as one embryo, mm. which splits. Um, so here we have two girls who are uh, identical in every respect, but not. And one of the lovely... Um, the, the lovely analogies you make in the book is that you, the, the ancient Greeks used to have a myth that uh, if a woman slept with a god and a mortal on the same day, she would have two babies and the father of one would be the god and the father of the other would be the mortal. And it's interesting to read into the twins um, the thought that Issy, Isolta, is obviously being fathered by the gods because she is favoured in her life and successful, while Viola um, must have been favoured by a poor mortal because she actually is desperately unhappy, she has an eating disorder. Can you tell us a bit more about the girls? And, and just incidentally, does this, does it bother you? you? Do your girls read this book and read anything into it about them? No, they, they didn't. They read it hoping that they'd see themselves in the book. They right. were, and they were quite offended that <laughs> they, they couldn't see themselves in the book at all. So. Oh, well, that's good for you, actually, isn't no. it? Because it would have, would have made you hopelessly self-conscious if you were worried about that. Yeah. I think it would really uh, affect your imagination. And yeah. Because you'd have a responsibility to the people that you were writing about. Mm. And you just can't do that. I, I tried not to think about them at all. In fact, I really didn't because the characters yeah. were completely different from them. OK. Yeah. Just, to, just to go back to Jim's yeah. question, then. Why have they become so different as people? Why has one become, as you say, blessed and sun-kissed almost, and the other is in a hospital bed and deeply mm. unhappy? What's happened? Well, in a, in a funny, I know what you're saying about the um, Isolt perhaps being the kind of, she's the blessed one. Yeah. But on the other hand, in a way, the, and I love the way you picked up on, on that because mm. um, nobody else ever has, but <laughs> the, in a way, Viola is, is also, perhaps she's the one who's sort of more, you know, the one that's sort of otherworldly. She doesn't seem to belong in this world. There seems right. to be, she's almost like a changeling creature. Yeah. She never finds her way out in the big wide world. And the forest is the only place that she can ever feel at home in because it's 
another world. Tell it's us about the otherworldly. forest. Otherworldly. Yeah. Um, the forest is, I actually grew up in a forest. So that bit's which one? totally it's autobiographical in Suffolk. In Suffolk. Which one? Yes. Which forest? Um, it's Tangham Forest, which okay. is part of Rendlesham Forest, which is mm. in the depths of Suffolk. Yeah. Um, and so we actually did live in a little cottage in the middle of the forest, and oh. that has been part of my psyche for so long that I really wanted to write about it. It just seemed like, you know, it would have been awful not to write about it because it was such an amazing way to grow up. Can I just tell you, stop you for a second? I, I used to live as a, as a boy from about 13 to when I left home in, in my late teens, opposite a big, almost a forest, a wood in, in Brentwood in Essex, a place called Hartswood, and that too had a major effect on my, my, mm. my adolescence. Yeah. I loved going into that wood. Uh, and there were places you could go when you knew no, no one had been for maybe months. You know, did you have that that sense of definitely isolation? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I went off with my younger siblings, and nobody knew where we were. That's right. We yeah. just were completely out in the wild, and to the point where we, if anybody did come along, we would hide from them, mm. literally throw ourselves into the bushes and wait until they'd gone past. And I bet you knew it like the back of your hand. Absolutely, we yeah. knew all the deer paths, yeah. all the secret ways, and it, mm. it, that does remain with you as an adult to the point where. You know, I have got a thing where I go into a room, I want to see people, I don't want them to see me. I've uh -huh. got this sort of sense that I, you know, need to slink along in the back ways and not not to be observed, which is quite hard in London. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it the, kind of it trees, does. You yeah. know, that's how you're brought, if you're brought up like that, it mm. stays with you, I think. Yes, and so. The events centre on one, we have to find out that the premise is set right at the beginning of the book. What has happened to these two girls to, to make them so different, to make their fortunes uh, diverge as they grow up? As we've said, Isolde is um, successful, uh, she's a, she works for the fashion magazine, which is your own background as mm. well, isn't it? So you, uh, you know all about that. And she has a, a boyfriend and a nice flat and all the London trappings. While Viola it has this wretched eating disorder, uh, which keeps her in hospital for a great deal of time. And the whole central premise of, of, of the book is what happened. And what happened was over one particular summer in this forest, uh, where they meet two other twins, don't they? Well, no, not two other twins. Another set of twins, yes. I should say, boys. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I just, it, it came to me as I was writing the book that I wanted them to meet up. I didn't want them to be completely isolated. And, and then I, my, my twins have always said, if we meet another set of twins, it's great. Because they're the only people who really know what it's like to be twins. So you immediately have mm. this empathy and this bond with, with the other twins. Um, and I thought that they would get to, and because they both come from dysfunctional families, they're outsiders, both groups are outsiders. Mm. So the two sets of twins become this very close group very, very quickly. And so although it happens, they're, you know, they, they bond incredibly quickly because it's also intense. They're right. in the forest, they're outsiders, they have the connection that they're identical twins. Right. And the moment that they see each other, there's a sort of moment of shock because yeah. they've never seen other identical twins before and they sort of mirror each other. On the back of the book, uh, there's a quote from the bookseller uh, which says, a perfect Richard and Judy read, a psychological thriller, the details of which are drip-fed to us through the book, building layers of complexity to the story at each revelation. Highly compulsive. And it is. And did you know, as Judy said at the outset, that I mean, this, this is your debut offering as a novelist, did you know you could write? Because you write beautifully. Did, did you know you could do it or did you discover it as you went? Uh, well, because I've always written I, and I have written other novels before, um, I knew that I was getting to the point where I, I understood how to put a story together. Mm -hmm. Because I think writing's a skill, isn't it? You have mm, to practice absolutely. it. You have to do it over and yeah, over and over again. Yeah. And most people who are debut novelists have written before, it just hasn't been published. Mm. Before, and yeah. you learn each time. Yeah. Yeah. And, so. and it, I must say um, that the subject of writing about twins is endlessly fascinating. I mean, I, know, I mean, your twins are very different. Um, my twins are very different. I know other twins, identical twins, identical twin girls actually, who both have the most severe eating disorders and the most intense communication between them and always have had. Ever since they were little, they were, you know, some twins have this, uh, this completely exclusive language which no one else is able to understand. So as a, as a psychological study, twins really are fascinating. Yeah. And, and, and your book's great. And I'm really glad to know that you've got twins because I was kind of puzzling. I was thinking, I know she's not a twin because I read your, um, your, your details. Where did she get this from? But you got it from being a mum. Yes. And that's the best way <laughs> yes. possible. Absolutely. That's lovely, Saskia. Thank you very much. It's a terrific book. Oh, really. thank you. Congratulations. I am Saskia Sargentson and I'm the author of The Twins. Have you ever felt real hunger pangs? 
Not just a growl, the casual complaining of your stomach missing a meal, the inconvenient rumble and gurgle when lunch is late. I mean, well, the deep this book was especially interesting to me, and I suppose to us too, <laughs> because we've got twins ourselves, grown-up boys, um, and they are eternally fascinating, to be honest. I mean, they look alike, um, they sound alike, um, they're friends who've known them since they were toddlers, still when they bump into them now, um, get them mixed up for each other. Uh, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary experience, really, to watch them grow up. Yeah. And the thing is, they're completely different. Well, yeah, they are, and, and so are the twins in Saskia Sargenton's book. But th that's what's interesting about it, because people assume that identical twins who are genuinely, genetically identical will turn into the same people, that they'll think the same, eat the same, talk the same. And they don't, but sometimes they do. Mm. Um, and she's gone down this road of com a complete differential. You know, one twin is enormously successful and ap apparently happy, and the other is deeply unsuccessful and apparently miserable. Um, but the reasons for that are the story in the book. The reasons for the twins turning into, well, I suppose girls who, who, who could easily have never even been related in, at, at any level. Mm. Um, come to the fore as the story unfolds. It's very delicately told, it's very gently told, but it has real impact, doesn't it? It's, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of writing. But you can use those pangs like a knife to slice out the bad things inside you. Eventually, you'll come to crave that feeling because hunger is a friend. With it, you can get down to your bones quicker than you'd think. Well, I feel them under Yeah, and I also think psychologically it's fascinating to think about what it must be like to be a twin. Mm. I mean... She's a parent of twins. Saskia is a parent of identical twin girls. We're parents of twin boys. Um, and so we observe it, but essentially we always observe the way they grow up and the way they develop from the outside because even though we're parents and love them tremendously, we never know what it's like to actually be them. And the experience of being a twin and having this identical mirror, mm. this mirror image of you next to you who looks exactly the same as you... Um, who apparently thinks the same of you, but doesn't, mm. and comparing what happens to you in your life, um, comparing which one's doing better at any one time. We all know that with all children, um, twins or not, you know, you, there's always one you're worried about yep. and one you're not, you know, and these, these, ba these parental balances shift all the way through. So, this, so actually studying twins and what happens to these lovely identical girls, mm. Isolt and Viola, um, and the way they develop and the way their lives sort of tragically unravel um, is fascinating. Well, it's a great backdrop to any story. Um, she, she's, you know, chosen a really good trick, really, with this whole sort of twin mm. idea. Mm. But the actual plot line itself, which we won't give away, and the way the story unfolds is in itself a triumph. And, you know, this is her first novel. It's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful debut. I noticed them looking at the scar on my face and I pulled my hair across trying to hide it, scared that they'd recognise the mark of Satan. But I wasn't alone. My sister was next to me, like she always was. Stronger, bolder. Her eyes were dry, and there was no wet patch under her chair. Don't say anything, Viola, Izzy said. You don't have to say anything. They can't make you. And she holds my hand tight, her curled fingers squeezing hard, steely as a trap. Um, when I was a little girl, I'd make up stories for my sister, who's five years younger than me. Um, and I've always written poet poems and um, short stories and things like that. And um, I think, but I was also a bit of a realist. And I, my mother always said, you've got to have your own career and you've got to earn your own money and be independent. And I, I didn't think I could possibly do that by being a novelist. So I went into journalism and uh, I've written, you know, as a career all my life, either as a journalist or as you know, as I've done some script editing, ghost writing, and plenty of other kinds of writing as well. I do think of myself primarily as a novelist, and I feel incredibly lucky that I can think of myself as that. I do still do the occasional other job if something comes up and somebody wants me to do a bit of ghost writing or a bit of copy for something. If I've got the time, I'll do it, because I think it's good for you to keep... Um, it, I've always written to deadlines. I've always... Um, you know, tried to be very professional about it, and it's good to have that in, and not just to allow yourself to... Uh, you know, to just to be too—I'm um, not self-indulgent. That's the wrong word, but I, I like to try and 
and yeah, stay on my toes really, have to, to have to think about other people's um, deadlines and what they need from me and the kind of writing they need. If you want to write, then you have to write. I mean, you know, it sounds silly, but you have to do it every day because it's a skill and you get better the more you do it. So you have to just keep writing. And every time you write a book, you learn something about yourself and about the writing process and about what works and what doesn't work. And in a way, you have to find your voice. That's one of the most important things, as well as the kind of skill of developing a story. It's your voice, and you have to be true to that. So this edition, and we're focusing on The Twins by Saskia Sargenson. But it seems we're not the only ones enjoying a good read this autumn with W.H. Smith. A book that I've read recently that I really, really enjoyed was Emma Donoghue's The Sealed Letter. It's a period book and I learned quite a lot about the women's movement and women's rights. But what really, really made it stand out was the, the twist in the end, I'll say no more. The Double Cross by Ben McIntyre. I'm not a huge fan of, of books set in the war, Second World War, but there's sort of something about this mixture of um, sort of fiction and fact running together. Uh, faction, I think it may be called. Um, a sort of spy story, a war story, a French woman with an obsessive love for her dog in there. You know, a bit of code breaking. From the Richard and Judy Book Club list, I would like to read Fault Line by Robert Goddard. It doesn't sound as a kind of book that I would normally read, but I'm intrigued by the first line that says, a search for missing documents in an international mining company becomes a voyage into dangerous waters. I'm hooked already. I don't tend to read modern fiction very much, but the fact that someone's missing, um, searching for something that's missing always is a good story. Open another new chapter with Richard and Judy. And, you know, that's what I, I like most about this book club, Judy. It's the chance to share good books with people who, you know, we regard as friends. I love getting an insight into the author's minds, and that's why it's best to buy the books from WH Smith, because they have so much added exclusive content in the back. I fancy unveiling a deep, dark secret next. I don't think that now is the time, my dear. Very droll. But isn't it the husband's secret next? It is. And find out more from Leanne Moriarty, yours to download and keep on the next edition of the Rich and Judy Book Club.